there were kind of revolts and riots before then that really did make changes and really influence kind of the the landscape of the island to introduce the code uh, and to actually move on that way uh, so it does show that kind of uh, people do have that power This weekend is a bank holiday weekend to mark the 250th anniversary of the Code of 1771. Many islanders' knowledge of that piece of legislation and the riots in St Helier that preceded it will be patchy at best, as this is not something that has been widely celebrated before. So why are we celebrating the Corn Riots of 1769 and the laws that followed it? What caused hundreds of islanders to storm the Royal Court building armed with clubs and sticks? And why is it significant now, two and a half centuries later? Stuart Nicholl, Senior Archivist at the Archive, joins us to explain why we're marking this less well-known period of Jersey's history. Stuart, this weekend uh, we have an extra holiday, a bank holiday, to celebrate the 252nd anniversary of the Corn Riots, but the 250th anniversary of something called the, uh, the Code of Conduct of 1771. Before we get into the detail of the day, could you just explain... Uh, set the scene for us. Explain what it was like living in Jersey at that time and what were the issues as a, that were the precursor for, for, for this eventful day. Yes, of course. I mean, it, it's really interesting reading back and seeing exactly what's gone on um, at that particular time. Um, you can see at that time the power is particularly concentrated in a family, really. It's one family over here. So the bailiff and the governor didn't actually reside in the island, so actually the power lay with the lieutenant bailiff, who was Charles Lomprier at the time. So Charles Lomprier uh, had been uh, in charge of the island and actually had proven quite popular previously. He, um, they, uh, people used to drink toast to him, and kind of they used to say, uh, kind of da- damnation to the lieutenant governor, and up with good Charles Lomprier. So it's interesting how his star kind of fell uh, from the uh, early 1700s hundreds to later on in the 1760s. Uh, You can see that um, kind of different people who opposed him uh, ended up, uh, they they got into trouble with the law because he was the one who was really enforcing the law. I mean, the island itself uh, is interesting. You obviously had kind of the the the, the Long Prayer family, at kind of the top of the uh, of the island pyramid, really. Mm. Uh, and then you had people who, um, I mean, you look at the setup of the um, of the states at the time, um, and the the royal court at the time. You had his brother, who was attorney general. You had his brother-in-law, who was the um, receiver general, um, and you had various uh, fathers, father-in-laws, cousins, etc., who were jurats. So it was so concentrated in that small kind of area uh, uh, of power. So just just to, to put it in the context of today, obviously we're used to having elected states members um, uh, with a bailiff who's non-elected but sits as president of the of the assembly but doesn't have a vote. It was very different then. So we didn't have elections. So was it effectively decisions were made by the jurats and the lieutenant bailiff? It was really. It was. I mean, that that's where it was. I mean, there was a state, but actually a lot of times the royal court were making the laws. So there was a real kind of tension between the two. And again, mm. the lieutenant bailiff sat at the top of it and kind of almost whatever he wanted went really Um, and that's really one of the precursors to the building up of of these these events in 1769 Uh, because you had other people kind of other upstanding members of 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 kind of of the jersey elite really Mm. who didn't have this power who wanted this power and so you start seeing these tensions growing between uh, various personalities within the island so there's a guy called Nicholas Fio who was a merchant uh, a landowner and you start seeing him have some tension with with Lomprier and the Lomprier family mm. which begins with um, they had a part ownership of uh, a boat together and then it was sold out from under Fio with no recourse from that his son was actually um, uh, beaten at one of the one of the schools, um, and uh, they, he brought a case against the the teacher. Uh, but Lomprier had helped to point the teacher, and so he kind of dismissed the case. And Fio took this to the Privy Council because he was angry at this, and they backed the Lieutenant Bailiff. Um, eventually, 
he brought cases against uh, the the lieutenant bailiff saying actually he wasn't going to get a fair hearing uh, in the royal court and he wanted his cases to be kind of held elsewhere. Um, and Lomprier very cleverly told him to write his uh, uh, his upset down in writing, which ended up him libeling half of the royal right. court, which then led to his arrest, which then led him to uh, kind of uh, be told that he had to uh, kind of uh, uh, beg for forgiveness um, and, and basically kind of... Uh, uh, kind of put himself down almost and so he wouldn't be seen as such an upstanding member of uh, of the island so he ended up fleeing to, to to the UK to kind of get away from these charges so you start seeing these cases and start seeing unrest within the parishes amongst these kind of uh, uh, people from the upper gentry, gentry yes. really so you've got kind of that that power struggle going on at that particular time but also you've got kind of the, 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 the lower classes, mm. the people who are struggling along um, in, in local life. Um, and the big issue, as it is for, for kind of uh, throughout history, really, is that they need to feed themselves. Yes. And uh, the problem was that there was a, a lack of crops in terms of corn. That was what uh, was uh, kind of uh, fed a, a great deal of the island. Um, and so there was really a, a lack of corn in the island. It's just an interesting, interesting point to to, to make that we we know obviously this, these predate the, the 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 Jersey boil and the Jersey cow. So um, just tell me a little bit about the industries in Jersey. Then how, how did people make ends meet? Was it mainly self sufficient farmers, or um, was there a, was there a burgeoning industry at the time, such the equivalent of finance? Was there a was there a fishing or or something that that made people wealthy if you were, had that opportunity to to make money i mean it, it was it was largely farming as as uh, obviously it kind of was for a long period of our history but as you say you kind of start having the cod trade uh, interestingly 1768 was when the uh, chamber of commerce was set up so mm. it was the first english speaking chamber of commerce in the world set up by merchants you had to be a ship owner in order to be a member of the chamber of commerce and they were very much kind of starting to um, advocate to the states for different policies in terms of uh, protecting fisheries, taxation, uh, making sure their fleets were safe when there was tensions growing with France at the particular time. I see. And and, and so we, we, we've got this malaise growing about food on the table. Um, that could have been bad harvest, but obviously it was more than that if it was, um, if there was... Uh, if it was directed to some extent around the, the ruling elites and the Lomprea family, what were they doing to upset the, the, the general populace as well as people like, uh, like Nicholas Fio? So, I mean, uh, the basis of uh, kind of the economy and land transactions at that particular time, they were all based around the cost of wheat. Uh, that you had rent, which were payments on on, on land, which was uh, was basically measured against the cost of wheat at the time. Mm. Now, the largest landowners in the island and the people who would benefit most was the Lomprier family, because as the receiver general, um, the receiver general paid a certain amount to the lieutenant governor, and any fines and any rent that he got above that, uh, he was able to keep himself. So uh, it was uh, in the Lomprier family's in interest to, to keep that uh, the cost of uh, wheat high, so that they were receiving kind of the the, the wheat rent money was at a higher premium than it would necessarily be. So you start seeing. There was some wheat brought in from the UK and there had been a law the previous year uh, saying that the exportation of wheat would not be allowed anymore. Mm. However, just before the tension started, that law was taken away. It was actually allowed and they were told that they could start exporting wheat once more to France. Uh, and you have really interesting situations. There's one particular situation that's mentioned uh, where a, a boat was about to export the wheat some woman, which is, is quite interesting, it was actually, it, it mentions kind of a, a, a dozen or so women who actually stopped the boat, entered onto the, onto the ship, uh, brought the wheat out and sold it uh, on the, on the harbour side, uh, and then actually gave the money back to the, to, to the kind of the boat owner. So it wasn't like they were stealing it, they were kind of almost uh, confiscating it and then, then kind of giving the profits back to them. So it's interesting, at this time of food shortages in Jersey, we were actually exporting the food that we were growing, which clearly um, upset the, the, the people who were going hungry uh, locally. And presumably the reason we were exporting it is because there was money to be made. 
There was money to be made, and and obviously the exportation of it meant that the wheat prices in the island was going to rise again. Um, there wasn't going to be as much over here. It was going to be scarcer, so it's going to rise again. So again, the Lompriers were going to stand uh, to make more money as a result of that. That's interesting. So we're starting to, to get a little bit tinder dry, and uh, there seems to be a lot of angst against the Lomprier family, both among the elites in Jersey who aren't in part of their cabal, but also uh, the families on the ground. So... Take us to this point of tension that it actually starts to become a riot, which I imagine would have been not really very happened very often in Jersey prior to that time. So so what was the incendiary matter? Um, in the end, I, I mean, uh, it's quite interesting. It's, it's difficult to, to kind of really uh, cast down exactly what, what was the thing that, that, that kind of lit the flame, really. There was uh, a guy who was um, who, who was arrested for, it seemed like he was insulting um, kind of the court, and he's mentioned within the demands, and that was just before the, the, the riot took place, so that there might have been something around that. But it seemed like it had been growing for a long time. It seemed like, uh, by the sounds of things, there there were meetings in the parishes and discussions behind the scenes that took place. So this wasn't kind of necessarily the spontaneous right, we're, we're going to do this. There was some plans behind this. It, it wasn't kind of an immediate action. So it looks like it was the kind of the tensions were building up slowly. The exportation of wheat was announced that it was going to be allowed again. People started being arrested in terms of kind of insulting uh, kind of the receiver general. Uh, and then at one point, obviously, they decided, right, we're going to need to take drastic action. And was there a Watt Tyler? Was there someone who was the, uh, who, who was the, uh, the figurehead or the leader of the riot? It's not easy to tell, to be honest. It's quite difficult to tell. It seems, I mean, there, there's various people who are mentioned. Um, there's a guy called Amis Durel. Um, interestingly, the Société have just um, released a book, um, which is there, uh, a translation of a, a journal by Daniel Mazervi, who was a, a, a jurat at the time, although he mm. was six, so not in the court at that time. And he mentions Durel quite a lot. Uh, also, a guy called Tom Grishy uh, is mentioned uh, quite a lot, although it seems he kind of carried on the fight after the mm. um after the uh the riots had taken place uh, and kind of he was arrested for various things but more actions after than the, the, the them themselves but it, it is interesting because it's not it's not easy to tell exactly who was leaders i mean you see afterwards that um there's a demand from the privy council that they discover who the leaders of the riot were and there isn't really kind of a mass forwarding of, of who it was so it seems there were a number of different kind of characters in different parishes so tell me about the day itself and what were the demands um so uh, the day itself so uh, there were a, a number of parishes involved in kind of the northern uh, side of the island uh, marching into town and what it sounds like was that they uh, met some guys uh, kind of at the parade who are working uh, kind of near where the hospital is now um, and uh, asked them if they wanted to join them and they, they kind of joined the troop and it is interesting again reading Mazervi's journal that it seems some people were kind of threatened into joining in the um, mm -hmm. into this crusade as well uh, it sounds like some people were persuaded on the way with kind of people kind of putting clubs into their hands A and bit saying of mob why rule. You, exactly why don't you join us kind of thing and there's various reports within there of kind of people uh, getting to town and then going and hiding in one of their friends houses here because they didn't want any part of it uh, but either way what seems to have happened is that they they reached the royal square and started kind of banging on the door demanded to be letting into the to the court so it was the the court d'eritage sitting that day it wasn't the states it was kind of the court d'eritage which deals with kind of land and property mm. and, and and transactions and things like that um and i think by the sounds of it it sounds like the um the, the people in the court at the time asked them to play if they could go away and they uh, <laughs> they declined rather vociferously I'm sure so they ended up um, storming storming the royal court um, it mentions within the the kind of the Privy Council minutes later that there were people armed with clubs a kind of violence against the the, the court I don't know that how much kind of actual assaults or things like that took place it's not exactly clear as to what happened other than them kind of bursting in and demanding that their their actions that these points that they wanted get written down in in the court record um and i mean it is really interesting we we have the court record at the archive or it's it's on display at the museum at the moment it, as part of our people uh, power protest exhibition 
And it's really interesting because you have the court record and it's actually been obliterated in terms of, of the points that are in there. It's been scrubbed out. Uh, someone went with a pen and just kind of scribbled over it completely. So until relatively recently, I wasn't kind of 100% sure what those um, what was written down really, in those particular points. Um, we actually, um, in the process of trying to find out what it was, we took it to the police and we took it to customs for them to, um, to scan the record to see if they could tell what it said underneath in terms of x-ray. Unfortunately, because the deletion took place at more or less the same time and with the same ink as what is written kind of yes. in, the, in the court, it was impossible to tell. However... This same uh, Daniel Mazzervi's journal that I was mentioning, actually, I found the book and actually in the back of that, someone had meticulously gone through basically kind of working out in between the scribbles exactly what was written down uh, in the court record at the time. Uh, so actually kind of transcribe exactly what was mentioned in that day. And broadly, presumably they were asking for an end to taxes or lower taxes. They were asking for more wheat to become available. Was it those immediate demands or were they perhaps more systemic as in um, the Lomprey family need to go? It was more immediate demands but it obviously those demand, demands were discussed before they reached the the court so there was again that element of uh, of kind of the lack of spontaneity that they had kind of chatted about what exactly they wanted uh, to present to the court and to be uh, read out a, a kind of around jersey so people are aware of what these demands were so you're right i mean it was taxation it was kind of the cutting down of tithes it was kind of cutting out of some of the seigneurs kind of rights in terms of money that they would receive uh, there was actually, they wanted uh, foreigners to stop being allowed to come into the island. So there was kind of an element of that as well within there. Um, and then it mentions Nicholas Fio uh, being released as well. So right. it is around uh, kind of taxation. It is around, uh, obviously, kind of people who were worried about um, the uh, their wheat. Actually, they didn't care too much about Nicholas Fio. They didn't know too much about him. But obviously, those slightly higher kind of level people, the, the people who didn't have the power but wanted the power, that was more kind of where they were coming from. So you can really see uh, kind of uh, it is interesting. Obviously, we talk about it as, as a revolt, but um, you, you kind of have that the, between the, the, yeah, the interests of the poor and the interests of the higher up, and they're all encompassed within uh, these demands that That's were set in front. Now, obviously, we've got the uh, an aftermath is the, the code of 1771, but that's two years later. So tell me, was the was the um, the riot considered a success immediately or were the uh, were the ringleaders or were people associated with it arrested and jailed? And how did we get to the the code, which generally is, is what we're celebrating this weekend? Uh, how do we get to that point? So it's re it's really interesting seeing what happened after it, because after that, such kind of a tense moment on the 28th, you kind of expect things to carry on. But actually, almost after the event, there's almost a period of calm where almost nothing happened. These uh, orders were proclaimed in, I think, 11 out of the 12 parishes. Um, uh, they were kind of published within there and proclaimed to the populace there. Um, but it kind of calmed down. And then on the 6th of October, all of a sudden, the states fled to Elizabeth Castle and had a meeting at Lisbeth Castle. Now, whether they were truly in fear of their safety, whether there was anything to that, and L'Omprier worried that he was going to get lynched if they had a meeting within the Royal Court building, or whether it looked good because they could say to to kind of the to, to the royalty to the monarch that actually they'd had to flee for their safety and have a have a meeting at the castle in order to kind of make sure that they were safe we're not 100% sure but it's really interesting that all of a sudden after about a week or so they kind of sprung into action um and from that meeting um which we've got um yeah kind of it, it's unusual because of it, obviously it says it was held at Elizabeth Castle uh, from that meeting they decided to send Lomprier and another couple of people People, uh, to the Privy Council in London to explain what had happened um, and obviously put over their side of the story uh, and to kind of to ask for help and to ask for some actions to be taken. That's interesting. And so moving on to the code. So um, presumably, is it a case of the Lomprea power starts to wane at this point? It is. I mean, 
it is really interesting. Um, you have um, uh, basically uh, a number of companies of uh, the military are sent over, um, and in charge of them is a man called uh, Rudolf Bentinck. Um, who I think his origins are Dutch, actually, but obviously right. he was linked to, to kind of the UK at the time. And he was really sent over to start to investigate and see what exactly had taken place. And obviously with this sudden influx of uh, kind of military men, things did stay calm and carried on being mm. calm. But um, I, I, kind of, I think it's interesting because the protesters at one point say, um, that uh, they might have expected kind of some protest when they arrived, but actually they kind of greeted them as saviors almost, kind of actually showing that they're kind of trying to get them on side uh, from the start. A, a, an equivalent of a royal commission coming over. It is, yeah, very much so. Uh, and Bentinck started going around, well, talking to obviously to the left and bailiff and finding out what happened, but actually talking to so many different people. He went out to a lot of militia displays, so kind of of basic militia kind of parading out to the parishes, talking to interested parties around the, around the island. And you can see that he starts kind of getting an idea of exactly uh, what happened at the time mm. and starts building up that actually it's not as clear cut. The first uh, Privy Council order is that uh, this was a, a kind of a, a complete insult to the king uh, and demanded that action be taken and that they offered a hundred pounds for any informers that kind of led to the arrest of any of the ringleaders um, but the next one you start seeing this this kind of situation soften and this obviously comes from kind of Bentic learning that actually everything wasn't as rosy as the kind of the Lompriers had said and they actually the people who were protesting had some right to protest and had some reasons to protest uh, so you start seeing um, uh, people in the parishes meeting and they're kind of putting together petitions putting together affidavits uh, saying that actually can we have some uh, some kind of uh, help in in bringing tranquility to the island again uh, by introducing some new legislation that softens the power of, of kind of the lieutenant bailiff that's really interesting and then finally uh, the, the the 1771 so this was something that was enshrined in jersey law what was actually what was actually decided then? What was enshrined? What what changed? So, I mean, I think the key thing was that prior to the 1771 code, things weren't written down. They were kind of in various law books and also kind of precedents that were set by the royal court. Uh, legislation sometimes came through the states, but often it was kind of legislated through the court as well and decisions they made as well. So the key thing that Bentinck mentions is this. So if I if I read a, a quick quote to you uh, from a, 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 a talk that he gave to the states, um, he said, every individual will be able to know how to regulate his conduct conformable to the laws of his country and be no more obliged to live in a continual dread of becoming liable to punishments. For disobeying laws, it was morally impossible for them to have the least knowledge of. I see, yes. So they didn't, that kind of, people were in danger. I mean, you look at the, the example of Theo and kind of constantly falling uh, into, into problems with the law because he kind of couldn't keep his mouth shut to a certain extent. Yes. And he wants to make a fuss as well. Um, but uh, as I say, it's kind of, uh, the Lieutenant Bailiff was kind of deciding as he went exactly how people were, were prosecuted. Um, so yeah, so it, it's really interesting. And then it kind of set down uh, different things in, in terms of exactly what, uh, different instruments of government w could do exactly what the laws are uh, around kind of uh, elections the constables lots and lots of different things and it said if it wasn't in the 1771 codes then kind of it, it wasn't I part see. of the law and, and was it almost the end of totalitarian dynasty politics in jersey was this the it was the uh, was this the end of the, the lomprea family and 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 rulers like them i mean it, to a certain extent certainly his power has eroded uh, a lot of the jurats were changed over uh, and what you start seeing actually interestingly is party politics which really builds up kind of in the 1800s kind of late 1700s 1800s where there's kind of opposing political parties um uh, within the system um but yes it, it, kind of that that power is definitely you see that that erosion his opponent was uh, was uh, named as lieutenant governor 
who was Moise Corbett, who ironically in a few years' time was the disgraced governor who kind of gave up the island and surrendered the island for the Battle of Jersey. Yes, that's right. Um, there was kind of the receiver general no longer received the amount of wheat that he'd, kind of the, the amount of rent. He had a kind of a set amount that he received that was set down. So it was no longer good for the Lomprier family to kind of make, make money that way as well. So there's definitely, you can see how... Uh, there's very much a kind of a democratization really of the island and moving towards uh, a, a much more ideal system of government, which hopefully we're doing still today. Yeah, that's and and this isn't a political question. This is one to an archivist. But what can what can we learn? What what can that period of history teach us today? And and it's certainly why is it worth celebrating? I mean, I think it's uh, it is interesting. I, I, as I said, it is really kind of indicative of. Uh, people power to a certain extent mm. in terms of actually protest does make a difference and that's uh, what my uh, we, we're showing at the museum really at the moment the corn rights is really kind of the start of that although there were there were kind of revolts and riots before then that really did make changes and really influence kind of the the landscape of the island to introduce the code uh, and to actually move on that way uh, so it does show that kind of uh, people do have that power uh, t to move the narrative and to move kind of where where we are in terms of, of our society and in terms of events this weekend i know you're you're from the the, uh, the heritage point of view have you have you got events on yourself that you're marking this weekend so i mean our big re it is really the exhibition that, that i would urge people to go and see because it starts as i say with the corn riots but then it, it goes out into the different uh the different protests that have gone on uh, over time kind of going up to very recent with kind of black lives matter and uh, and things like that Stuart, thank you so much for coming in pleasure thanks to Stuart nicole for talking with me today and thank you for listening to the Bailiwick podcast. You can find the podcast on all the usual pod places. And don't forget to like and share. The music at the beginning and end of this podcast is I Shift My Weight by Luno. Tune in next week for more. 